All right, um, this is the uh, uh, the best practice part one session. And my name is uh, uh, Jen Chen, uh, a professor uh, at high school in Syracuse University. And I'm the moderator for uh, this best practice session. And I think you may have received, uh, um, you know, different instruction about the time, uh, how much time you have for presentation. And uh, I think it might be better because this is more of a, uh, you know, discussion uh, type of a session. Um, so probably we should have all the presentation done and then we have, you know, a general discussion session. Uh, is that working for you? Um, okay. All right. Okay. Let, let's do that. Okay. Uh, our first um, presenter uh, is uh, Sophie Sujin Chen. Um, she is the assistant research fellow at the Institute of History and uh, um, Philosophy or Philology. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's a special word or a typo, but uh, Academia Seneca in Taiwan. And she's also the executive secretary of Academic Seneca Center for Digital Culture um, Cultures. So uh, her presentation today uh, will be um, talking to folks on modeling field, uh, field work data of human ecology. And I will uh, let Sophie go ahead. Um, so you will have about, um, you know, 10 to 12, 30 minutes to talk, uh, depending on, you know, uh, but go ahead, please. Hi, good day. I'm Sophie Chen. I will represent our team to give the presentation. The data for this case study is extracted from the open license field survey data produced by the project known as Social Cultural Survey of Rural Taiwan, short as CSRT. In the following presentation, we show how we used the study result of the Chishang Township in the eastern part of Taiwan as an example to conduct a study on data reuse and data enrichment, which mainly includes topics such as semantic data modeling, data visualization, and research data management by applying FAIR principle for lake data. The S CSRT is a research program scheduled for five years. The research team is composed of scholars with interdisciplinary backgrounds, including in the fields of sociology, history, and anthropology. The study uses methods of field research and historical document analysis and literary analysis to present the results of the investigation and study the current situation of more than 100 rural areas in Taiwan. In the process of conducting the project, we have adopted different methods to obtain the needed data. For instance, using the method of field observation to interview local people to acquire records on the social and cultural information of a place, using the method of oral history to interview elderly people to record their life history, collecting local data and images such as archival data and old photos. In the process of conducting a field survey, data will be collected at different stages. In our cases, six different data types have been generated as follows. Before the field survey, researchers will collect the second-hand research data from the research sites 
including information on the fieldwork location, bibliography of fieldwork area, references, and government data. During the field survey, researchers will plan schedule for conducting the survey and produce multimedia files, such as the oral history files, photos, and video audio clips. After the field survey, researchers will compile the findings and write the field survey reports. As a result, six different core metadata tabs with more than 150 kinds of metadata fields will be generated in the core survey process. To manage these different research data, we have developed the Taiwan Rural Human Ecological Field Survey System for researchers to upload, manage, retrieval and analyze survey data. The metadata of the database is based on the functional requirements from interviews with scholars involved in the project. However, due to the sensibility of the topic and the protection of personal information, some of the survey contents cannot be fully open to the public. So, the possibility of data reuse and enrichment has been further restricted. The study selects the open licensed data from the database and conducted a pilot study in order to facilitate further applications of linked data and semantic retrieval. So the, this study is based on open licensed fieldwork data and aims to explore methods that can enhance metadata quality of linked data as well as its potential applications in digital humanities research through semantic retrieval and data visualization. The research question includes first how to integrate heterogeneous fieldwork data from different disciplines and to present the context of research results. Second, how to integrate and link the data to external open resources in order to enrich data content and create beta, better completeness. Third, how to enhance the metadata quality to improve the reusability of research data. Fourth, how to provide semantic retrieval and visualization of the results, which may help generate new research topics and discoveries. How to respond to the challenges we have developed the following practical solutions. First, facing the variety of heterogeneous data, we have produced an open uh, an ontology model for rural fieldwork data and developed an application profile to integrate data semantically. Second, convert the fieldwork data into triple structured link data to integrate resources of internal and external data sets, make it offer a more complete research base for fieldwork study. Third, we provide sparkle endpoints to semantic queries. The queries results can be presented through a triple-based format or by tools for data visualization to make queries data easy to understand. Fourth, introduce data catalog vocabulary decade to improve metadata quality for FAIR principles, which means to enhance the findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse 
the fieldwork data. In this case study, we use a link open data lifecycle model, which has been developed by Academia Sinica as methodologies to conduct the link open data sets transformation. The model contains 12 steps. In this talk, we would like to focus on three of the steps. First is data modeling. We, you, we reuse schema.org as a basis to design the data model at the item level and adopt DCAD to describe information of the data set at the collection level. Second, data reconciliation. We make a link to external resource, resources, including geonames, Gates AAT, and Wikidata to enrich the geographic and uh, demographic and ethic information of the fieldwork data. Third, Data queries in Sparkle, we developed Sparkle endpoint and query examples to help users to retrieve the integrated in internal and external data more flexible. In addition, we use Tableau, ArcGIS Story Map, and other tools to enhance visual presentation of search results and assist investigators to discover other issues for further discussion. An ontology for the field work data has been developed, including 16 classes and 76 properties from 11 vocabularies. Most of them are reused from the vocabularies of schema.org, Darwin Core Terms, and DCAT. The study has proposed an application profile for rural fieldwork data to document the definition and specialized, specialized description needs of the classes and properties developed in the ontology. In light of data reconciliation, external resources such as geonames, Gates, AAT, and Wikidata are linked to the data set to enrich the information on the field work place. By using semantic technology, meaningful relationship between internal and external data can be connected to each other. Result 4, Sparkle Endpoint. In this study, we have developed a Sparkle Endpoint for query the data set. In addition, six query examples have been designed based on interview with fieldwork researchers in terms of their demands. The query result can be presented both in the format of triples or by using the tools for data visualization. Result 5, data visualization. In the case study, we also developed a procedure to provide query result in a better understandable presentation by using data visualization. In the beginning, we will ask the survey team to know what are the interesting questions to the team based on reviewing the original survey data. Based on these questions, we will convert them into Sparkle query language, and the result will be presented in the format of triples. In this step of data visualization, we will transform the data result into visual figures. The Sparkle query res result will be reorganized and to be converted 
us infographics by using tools for data visualization, such as Tableau tools. Finally, members of survey team are interviewed, asking them to compare the result of Sparkle query with the visualization charts and to understand whether the visualization is more conducted to their interpretation and the meaning of their research. Let me take one of the data visualization results of the Sparkle query as an example. The question is about least places that produce rice and their demographic information. This question will find different kinds of demographic data for the retrieved, retrieved places, such as five-year population, male, female, and elderly publication in recent years. By using visual charts of tables, dashboard, which can integrate different aspects of a single statistic chart. We also ask field researchers what they thought of such an infograph. The advantage is that it can list data from different sources at the same time, so it's useful to clearly compare the demographic differences between the field locations and it's clear to grasp the research focus of the data. To improve the data quality and make the whole data set correspondent to the FAIR principles, we have adopted a verification process by designing data model and working on the set up of the data set. At this, step, at this stage, all the steps of the LOD lifecycle model are mapped to the verification process. To meet the spatial correct character of the original data of the fieldwork survey, we even extend the content of the verification process with steps of data de-identification and data versioning. Conclusion, using linked data to enhance semantic connection between internal and external data resources, which helps to break through the search limitation of the database also applying fairness principles in this study to enhance quality of data, data set and the collection level. Proposing a verification workflow, workflow extension based on the needs by data processing for field work. In the future, the verification process will be integrated into the LOD lifecycle model to improve workflow when creating linked data. Also, we have proposed a semantic model design and metadata application profile focusing on the fieldwork research in rural areas, which can serve as a base for further scholars to design the workflow on field work and metadata structures for data recording and as a suggestion to developers for system construction and open data retrieval. Using data visualization to enhance the presentation of results of data retrieval and meet the needs of field investigators to discover hidden research issues. Finally, providing functions for semantic query in LOD's dataset and data download to 
intensity, findability, interoperability, reusability between data resources. Here are the team members involving within this research. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sophie. Um, that, that is a very interesting project. Um, and well, uh, you know, the, the audience needs to uh, you know, save your questions to the last. Our next presenter is um, Miso Lee. Is she here? Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Miso Lee is uh, um, uh let's see um a librarian i guess uh at national library of korea um, metadata and a sustainable access division uh since 2017 um and, and i think uh, her uh bio information is on the conference website and her presentation is uh the national library uh, of careers follow-up project for an automatic uh, subject indexing and the role of metadata librarian. Uh, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Miso. I have been working as metadata librarian at National Library of Korea. Today, I'm going to talking about automatic subject indexing development project conducted by National Library of Korea. I also talk about the points I was responsible for and cared about as metadata librarian during the project. These are the things I will talk about today. First, the overview and purpose of the project and the algorithm development process will be mentioned and I will mention what the core source of data of this project was and how it was extracted. Lastly, I will present the result of testing the algorithm and the possibility of using it for cataloging work. This project is a cooperative project between Gyeongbuk National University and Library. Professor Yung Ri in the Department of Library and Information Sciences proposed a joint study in early 22 and we decided to start it because it was also related to an important issue in our library. Unlike previous studies, this is the first project to use only the data generated by our library as learning data. The purpose of the project can be viewed in three main ways. There is a deviation in accuracy and efficiency due to individual differences in librarians' experience. We want to ensure average accuracy through the automatic grant tool. Next, we were stimulated by a foreign-made automatic subject index and classification recommendation tool. We also wanted to develop an automatic subject indexing framework in Korean language. And I think that the development of such a tool will be very helpful to disseminate our subject heading nationwide. This project is also consistent with the long-term goals of the National Library of Korea. In order to advance the librarians' work and strengthen their R&D function, an attempt to automate a part of cataloging work is essential. We want to examine the possibility of using the algorithm as a cataloging tool. This figure shows the flow of the project. Source data is gathered in the leftmost basket. All bibliographic data with subject tones were subject to extraction. Also, full text and table of contents were extracted only those linked to the target bibliographic data. In addition, 
the entire tome and scissors of the National Library subject heading were completely used in the study. The collected data is tokenized for machine learning and then trained by a deep learning algorithm. After giving the subject terms to the test bibliographic data through the learned algorithm, we try to calculate the recall rate, accuracy rate, and F1 score. It then compares what the librarian gives to what the algorithm gives and compares the result between the two. Based on the judgment of metadata librarian, the necessary elements are extracted separately, not the full mark. I have picked out the elements of bibliographic data that are suitable for machine learning features. The content elements of the bibliography were mainly selected, but the physical elements, such as the number of pages, were also selected. Next, let's take a moment to mention the subject term, which is the purpose of this machine learning. Our subject heading is given to bibliographic data as post combination index. Therefore, it is a favorable condition for automatic assignment rather than pre combination type subject term assignment. In addition, about 260,000 keywords are connected to each other in a scissorous hierarchical relationship. This screen is a subject term data inquiry page provided by our library and support service. It can be seen that the hierarchical relationship is also expressed in pictures. From now on, I would like to introduce some of the impressive things of source data. The table on the left is the amount of data extracted for this study. About 990,000 bibliographic data and 250,000 subject title data. The pie graph on the right shows the number of times the subject term is assigned to the bibliographic data by section. The serious thing is that over 70% of the subject terms have never been assigned to the bibliographic data. These subject terms cannot be machine learned. It was one of the difficulties of the study. The line graph on the left is the result of finding out how many subject terms are given per one bibliographic data. On the horizontal axis, there are 10 divisional themes represented by the Korean Decimal Classification System. It can be seen that on, a, on average of 1.72 subject terms were given and many subject terms were assigned to the field of art and history. The table on the right is the result of investiga investigating the case where the title or table of contents and the text of the subject term are the same. In the case of literature, religion, or art books, this is not a recommended situation but in areas such as social science or technical science, it is recommended because it can help search performance. About 30% of subject terms were observed to be the same text. This is an advantage for machine learning. The following is the process of setting the algorithm based on source data. Algorithm development researchers recommended the transfer algorithm. They said that it is evaluated as showing the best performance in the field of natural language processing. Transparent learning, covert, and electron models, which are language models suitable for bibliographic data and table of contents, are applied. F1 score measurement results are shown in table. First, 
The result using only a single tile feature is about 0 0.67. This is a measure of 254 subject terms indexed into bibliographic data more than 1,000 times. The second and third columns are the performance evaluation results for 304A subject terms assigned more than 300 times in bibliographic data with a table of contents. It can be seen that performance tends to increase when using multiple features. When the machines assign some subject term, the probability that it partially or completely matches the originally assigned one by librarians is approximately 64.7%. Therefore, we try to discover the discrepancy pattern by comparing the, the original subject term with the automatically assigned subject term. We compare the subject term given by the machine with 99% certainty and the subject term given by librarians. This content suitability judgment task is an area that only catalog and metadata librarians can perform. I verified 100 data for each of four cases. First, it is a case in which the librarian has given only one subject term, but the machine has given one different term from that. In the second case, the librarian gave only one subject term, but the machine recommended multiple subject term. In the third case, the librarian gave several subject terms, but the machine recommended only one. In the fourth case, both the librarian and machine assign multiple subject terms, but they do not match each other. All cases were selected as examples that did not match each other, and in the case of multiple subject terms, some partially matched and some did not completely match each other. This table is a sample of materials tested. As shown in the rightmost column, the suitability of machine-recommended subject terms was evaluated in three stages. Let's briefly explain the first example. Hangul 2005 is a word processing program that is widely used in Korea. The librarian gave the subject term computer programming, but the machine recommended the word processor and produce results with higher accuracy than humans. The symbol in the judgment column indicates the degree of fitness. Round shape indicates that the machine give subject term is appropriate and X indicates that it is totally not. The triangle shape means that what the machine gives is insufficient because it presents only partial aspect of materials. This table is showing the judgment result. It should be noted that the machine seldom recommends a completely long subject term. The machine was able to recommend appropriate subject terms, even partially, in most cases. However, when the machine recommended a more appropriate subject term, the text indicating the subject term was explicitly displayed in the title or table of contents in many cases. If the librarian has given an insufficient number of subject terms, it is judged that the machine can recommend appropriate subject terms to be supplemented Overall, it was judged that the algorithm is useful and helpful for librarians. Sometimes a machine can penetrate the core of the material and recommend one subject term. A good index word was also attached to the material that the librarian had insufficiently indexed. However, the points to be improved are as follows. There is a performance deviation by subject in the Korean decimal classification. 
In the field of technology, natural sciences, and social sciences, the title often clearly indicates the subject. So it is easy for the algorithm to recommend an appropriate subject term. However, they show the relatively large number of errors in literary and religious sources. The good news is that the type of errors are rather standardized, so there is a hope that they can be corrected. And the other one is that special deep learning models should be developed for infrequently indexed subject terms. The machine had a hard time learning about keywords that did not, not appear more than a thousand times. Although this point could not be corrected due to the short study period, the research team suggests a way to correct it. It would be good to improve this part through follow-up studies. We believe that the further research will yield better results, and we will consider how to apply it to the library system as soon as we can afford it. Here's what I've prepared. If you have other questions about the algorithm, please send it to this email address and we will get an answer to the development research team. All I can answer today is about the work of librarian, so I hope you understand this. Thank you for listening to our project so far. Thank you, Miso. That's very interesting because uh, subject representation has always been a big challenge in libraries. Um, okay, um, let's continue our uh, next um, presentation by uh, Maswani um, from, um, well, Maswani is a senior lecturer uh, working at University Technology Mara uh, in Malaysia. Um, she has a 11 years of ex experience uh, in the uh, Faculty of Information Management. So her presentation uh, is about social media, right? Social media uh, metadata. Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, Hello, good day everybody. I am Mazwani Ayu Maslan from University Technology Mara, UITM Malaysia. And I would like to present the best practice of the hashtagging usage in a Facebook community page, Clapper. In this presentation, we will see how the hashtag contribute to advocate awareness, solidarity among the social media community, and the process flow for the hashtag chosen. By definition, the Hashtag is a social tagging that is a particular application of tagging that is used to help an individual or group locate and find particular material. Social tagging are also a community-based system without the conventional hierarchy of taxonomy. Hence, there are other terms like collaborative tagging, social metadata, social classification, social indexing, and folksonomy. Uh, that is fall under the same spectrum of definition in hashtagging. Using a hashtag can give the voice to the voiceless. It is an effort that ensures that a goal is accomplished and reached the target audience and the usage of appealing a hashtag can improve awareness and spread campaign. The first time usage of hashtag is in 1988 using a system called Internet Relay Chat or RIC that categorized messages, pictures, information, and video. Users can utilize hashtag searches to identify materials that is related to them. If we go through Facebook, one of the top social media that have many community pages 
The pages will devote to a subject or experience that are jointly held by the group associated by with it. The community pages will enable you to connect with people who have like interests and experiences, just like the official pages for companies, organizations, and public individuals. Some of the highlights for having a dedicated community page in Facebook are to accept variety in terms of geography, background, and other factors into a user network with shared objective and interests. A huge number will frequently make it easier to carry out a variety of community service projects and a high level of awareness can be used more broadly. Another one would be it will be increasing the organic reach and also learn valuable market research data. It also a personalized cheer leading squad and also building brand loyalty and get authentic feedback. The subject of best practice presentation today will be the Clef Leap and Palette Association Malaysia, or for short, CLAPM community Facebook page. So, what is CLAPM? It is a non profit, non government organization that manage by a group of elected volunteers. Members will compromise members are comprised of a parents with children with that born with a cleft condition or adult born with cleft and healthcare professionals who manage such individuals. The aim of this organization is to help individuals born with cleft have the correct knowledge and support to obtain an optimal plan to manage and treat the condition. There are three key activities undertaken by this organization. The first one is to convert anxiety of CLEF parents or individuals into hope and assurance by providing counseling and consultation. The second one would be to provide moral support and advice on the management of CLEF cases by collaborating with hospitals and health professionals. The third one would be sharing a key information to allow parents or CLEF individuals to make a knowledge-based decision. Now, let's look, let us look at the purpose of using the hashtag in community page. First is the awareness. Organize of a collective voice to support causes like the hashtag ice bucket challenge and also another example is hashtag autism awareness. By generating more shares and donations, including a hashtag in a charity activation will raise awareness. Second would be the location. It will connect with those who are present there and somewhere that can be motivated by a hashtag like Wood Manchester. The third one would be collaboration. You, have, you can take note of the content your target market is producing and claim it for your brand. For instance, Red Bull observed that individuals were using their cans to take pictures in which they were well positioned to produce something distinctive. Another one would be the relevance. It will determine the hobbies, interests and hashtags your market target, target market uses to define them such as hashtag be creative every day. Women can be pushing themselves to the limit and being open about their feeling have been part of a large empowerment movement according to the Sport England with the hashtag this girl can as they capitalize on this behavior. Another one would be solidarity. What difficult might your target audience encounter? Give them a place to vent like hashtag mom life or life after lockdown. Selfies that displayed a younger, healthier you were rewarded with the hashtag MyHealthTea, which encouraged individuals to offer their good eating advice. 
Another one would be inclusion. By participating in a community already in existence, such as hashtag bakers on Instagram. This is the table of comparison to signify the study from the previous research. Gong and Zhang in 2016 have mentioned about the user of social tagging tools are driven to participate and add tags by extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. These show that there are a spark of new factors that could impact users' acceptance of social media tools. Klosterman in 2018 have mentioned about the content that displayed in images is heterogeneous and images really show what users think and feel in or about the situation displayed. This aggregate and mapping the textual information for the resulting image clusters in the form of associative network empowers marketers to derive meaningful insight by inferring what consumers think and feel about their brand regarding different content and context by adding hashtag it can be done. Guha in 2015 have mentioned about billions of users worldwide in online social network. They are the new venue of innovation with many challenges of research. By understanding of user interaction in online social network can provide important insight into question of human social behavior and also the pattern of social platform and its applications. Okay, this is the factors contributing to the development of hashtag. Um, it is uh, broken down into four factors that is phrase, interact, personalize and also trend. Four phrases, a, uh, it says that a hashtag is simply a keyword phrase spelled out without spaces with a pound sign that is the hashtag sign in front of it. For example, Clef Awareness Malaysia and Embracing Smiles. Okay, these are both hashtags. So the Clepon has decided to establish hashtags according to the light of the events. For instance, hashtag Embracing Differences is used for the Clef Awareness Month in October. Hashtag Clepom and hashtag, hashtag Clef Awareness for generic content. Hashtag Clef Warrior, hashtag Clef Mom, hashtag Clef Dad and Clef hashtag clef son uh, and so forth, clef sister, clef daughter, for testimonial or individual post. As for interaction, the use of hashtag is essentially a way to group together conversation or content around a certain topic, making it easy for people to find content that interests them. Hashtag can be used on just about any social media platform. The same approach of consolidating content is used to empower hashtag to call up for a program like running event like hashtag clap run, hashtag clapum and hashtag clef lip palette and Malaysia um clef, clef lip and palette Malaysia. As for personalized, uh, a hashtag that is personalized can reach a personalized community our target community. So the use of native language will enhance the search result as we are based in Malaysia and most of the community speak Malay. For example, we have hashtag senyum clapum that, is, uh, that means uh, smile with clapum and hashtag bulan kesedaran clef that is um, clef awareness month. This have been used in early 2003 for the Clef Month in Malaysia to advocate and try to reach the local who are 90% of the members of the Clapham community. Next, we have trend. Uh, knowing how to create a hashtag that will trend is a fundamental marketing skill. Hashtags are amazing business tool for generating buzz about your campaign event or special promotion, finding leads, increasing brand awareness and much more. Okay, to that, Clapham is blessed with an easy abbreviation that is easy to remember that is the hashtag Clapham, hashtag uh, Clapham uh, with uppercase and hashtag Clapham Malaysia.
the usage of hashtag in Facebook community group Clapham can result a taxonomic vocabularies extracted by examining the correlation that form between different tags. It also improved the collaborative tagging exhibit um, a form of complex system dynamics and also there are 12.6% more engagement by using hashtag in a community page group. As for conclusion, the purpose of using hashtag on social media is to inform follower or user and an algorithm that your content is related to a specific topic or category. Finally, it allows users to easily find relevant content across platform, increasing the likelihood that your content will be discovered by a larger or niche audience. Prior research have confirmed that hashtags are effective in both your post caption and the comment section. Thank you for listening my presentation. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, the social media, yes, a very complex landscape. All right, uh, let's continue our uh, next presentation. Uh, it'll be by, uh, let's see, um, by Hai Ching Ling uh, from Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley uh, Library. Um, and Hai Chin is a uh, the head of technical services in East Asian Library, UC Berkeley, and he has been studying uh, digital humanities and uh, uh, ancient Chinese materials um, and how to make them, um, you know, more uh, useful. Um, Hai Chin, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Professor Chin, for your uh, introducing. So, um, good afternoon. Um, it's very nice to see you all. We have a, a conversation talking about the new technologies. Uh, today, I will share my experience uh, on using the machine learning to extract CO uh, in uh, marks from uh, Chinese rare books. As the development of uh, uh, digital collections, we are have uh, more and more digital images. How to extract objects from uh, uh, digital images will be the challenge for the librarians, particularly for the metadata librarians, uh, because uh, we are familiar with the structured data, but for the digital images, it's a totally different story. Uh, compared to the extract data. This experiment is trying to find some way, uh, try to learn some lessons from uh, uh, using the digital uh, machine learning technology to deal with the digital images. So serious impressions on real Chinese books. As we can see, a lot of the Chinese books has the seals. Can you see the, my screen? Uh, no, I'll show you the, probably it's not good. Uh, the book, there's a seals, the collector seals. This is quite important for Chinese rare book studies because it is provide valuable information about the history of the book. But even for the overseas Chinese uh, collections, it will give the evidence how the book traveled from the China to the overseas. Uh, so particularly important for the uh, overseas Chinese studies. Um, Berkeley has the uh, large digitization project for Chinese rare books. We try to digitize all the Chinese collection, rare book collections in digital format. And we have the large digital collections, but how to extract the uh, seals impression from the digital images will be interesting. Uh, a lot of the scholars and uh, 
and also interacting the librarian if we can develop uh, seals, connections, databases will be useful for the scholars. But uh, it is a challenge because the contents of the seals are often uh, challenged to recognize and identify because the seals content usually uh, present as the traditional Asian Chinese font, like uh, Zhuan Su. Uh, it's a very old Chinese font, uh, usually in thousand years ago. Uh, you can see the images here. It is the uh, example of the seals on the Chinese red box. It is a very old uh, font styles called Zhuan Su. The identify and extract the seal impression using machine learning is have been done many times. It's not new technologies. Uh, people, a lot of people do some experiment to do this. In terms of machine learning, identify uh, and extract the seals from the digital images is the problem of object detections and the segment. So it is, it is very common technology. It's nothing new for that, but it is worse to experience it in Chinese rare books because the context of the Chinese rare books is quite different with other objects like Google did or Facebook did or something like this. Here I want to share um, a studies of utilize the mask RCNN model to extract the seals from Chinese red books. Uh, what is a mask RCNN? I'm not able to uh, discuss here the in details in the very short times. And uh, basically this is the object detection model based on a deep uh, conventional neural networks. Uh, it is uh, developed by uh, Facebook AI researchers in uh, 2007. So you can see it is not new, but uh, it's applied a lot of uh, areas. People are using this model to detect the object. It works well. Um, for the library, we are not expected to the most advantageous technology, but we use more like reliable technologies. Um, the model will be generated uh, bounding boxes and second maskers for the each uh, instance of object in the uh, image. It is will be go to the two two stages. First of all, they would uh, generate the proposal area of object. It's a very big area. Uh, detect the object potentially in somewhere. And then secondly, they were protected objects in classes and narrow down, narrow down, reshape the, uh, the area. And then finally, they created the maskers of the object. This is a principle, but uh, uh, we don't have time to go the, to further to detail the technology issues, but uh, yeah, this is a model and it works well. And the people were asked why use the mask uh, RCNN. There's a several reasons. First of all, it's very simple. It's, it is uh, developed by the Facebook and based on a, a large, huge data sets. So it is simple and it is reliable. And also the performance is quite high. You can see it later. Uh, the performance is quite good and it's efficient. And I just uh, trained five uh, equals of the model and can get good results, and it is flexible. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the system environment, um, they only support uh, TensorFlow uh, 10, uh, 1, if now TensorFlow becomes the uh, version 2, will be not supported. So we have to downgrade our environment to use that model. Now I will show you the example, uh, the source, the first of all, we're talking about the source of the training data. 
I, I think it's a key part of our experiment. We collected 140 images of the Chinese red box with the seal impressions. Uh, each image probably contains more than, more than one seal. So in total, it includes 400 seal marks. You can see the data set is not big, but it, it works. Um, and there's a two kinds of the data source. You can see one is from the real Chinese red book, which is the real collector seals from the Chinese, Chinese book. And the second data source is the, from the seal collection. Uh, it is also the red book, but it is particular for the seal collection. So why we choose these two data sets? Because the, the quality of the data is different. Uh, seal collection is much better than data uh, quality, but the uh, normal seal, uh, the box, uh, it's lower resolution. So we can compare the different source. Before that, we prepare data. We need to extract the, um, the seals from the sample data. So I make a program to uh, extract the data from the images. You can see we can highlight the seals and extract the position of the uh, seals on the images and some uh, objects. Uh, this is just the, uh, for the extract the features of the seals from the uh, images. As a result, we, we can have the uh, noted, uh, annotation files, which will support uh, the model. The files include some information about like the, uh, the name of the files, which is the size of the images and the name of the object, which we call this, this sample data we call the Bible Fang Yin. It's, it means the white uh, font with the square uh, seals. And then the class ID, which is what it means of the uh, name, uh, because the, for the machine learning, we are not able to use the Chinese characters. We have to uh, use uh, digits. So we compare with the class ID and, uh, and the meaning of the ID. And then the location of the seals on the, on the image in the images. So this is a location uh, images. So probably this this kind of the information will support the model. So we collect 140 uh, images. We have uh, 140 annotation files, which can support the model. This is an example of the. Uh, samples uh, that combined with the, the two data source, which is the seal collections, as well as the seals from the real Chinese books. And the model is quite simple. You just load in the model and the well-established model, and then you can e very easily use. And they also, you can also use, use the pre-trade the uh, weights uh, works quite well. And you training, I only training five times, but uh, get good results. You can see the uh, the loss is quite uh, low, uh, so it works well. This is the result. Once we run the uh, testing samples, we can find we can detect the seals on the Chinese red box page images. This is five, four seals, and this is a four. But interesting, when the machine detects the five, because the two seals, it's overlap. Um, so this, you can detect it, uh, the five seals, and it will tell you what kind of the seals uh, in here and the uh, confidence rates of each detections. Uh, it's 
it's okay, we can accept. That's the result of the CO settlement. But the second stage, we want to not only the seal, but try to identify the characters in the seals. It is really challenging because all the characters is in the ancient fonts. Even for the people, it's very difficult to identify. It is a challenge for the Chinese uh, report cataloger to identify the uh, seals. So we try to use machine learning to help us to identify the characters in the seals. So it's the same. We make the annotation files, but this time we based on the characters. So the samples here, it is recorded year. So we we collect the year, the all the features of the year in the images, like name, the, the class ID, same as the previous I show, and the location of the year in the images. And then we make it about 107, uh, 170 uh, characters like this. And then we run the model, uh, training the model. After that, we just we can recognize some of the characters very successful recognize like E, uh, also correct. Because the um, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, but uh, uh, yeah, protected. We can detect it, the in quite well, and tone is quite good. So uh, that's the. Uh, it seems it works. And uh, some characters were not able to detect it because the sample too small. It's not enough samples for for the Chinese characters. We will discuss later for the sample, the size of samples is quite important for the successful of the, the machine learning. So we discuss this sample. You can see the sample, if the sample is too small, uh, machine learning is not work. But the sample, the size of the sample is not only things we have to think of the diversity of the data and the quality of the data set. If we only I'll show you the example here, you can see this is in. We collected multiple ins with a multiple formats and the shapes, uh, colors. So that's why we detect the in it's quite well. It's O in. O in is detected. So it's not only we have the large data set, but we have to have the various of the data. Um, and that's the really important for, for machine learning. And also the number of the features is also the big factors affect the accuracy of the detections. For example, the color uh, the color of the images, the shape, and the number of the characters in the shapes will also affect the results of the machine learning. And the last change, and also the challenging things, is the image enhancement. Because before the um, before the machine learning, we use the original raw images from the direct from the digitization project. Um, the result is okay, but not uh, expected like a high uh, accuracy. So we did uh, some uh, image enhancement. For example, we convert all the images to gray images to, uh, to enhance, to, to help the machine to extract more features from the images. Uh, we continue to work this work because we don't have the solid conclusion now. Uh, we don't know how, uh, what is the best way to enhance the images, but this is the ongoing project we are working on that. That's all I can share with you uh, today uh, about our experiment. It's a very small project, but we still learn a lot of lessons from it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Haiqin. This is a, a very technical, you know, high, you know, highly technical project. Very interesting. Um, it could have much broader application down the road. Hope, hopefully, we'll have some discussion uh, later. Now um, we have uh, uh, one last presentation by uh, by Cui Jian Xia from Shanghai Library, and she is a researcher at uh, uh, Shanghai Library, and I think uh, um, have some um, administrative uh, responsibility for the uh, information systems in Shanghai Library, um, and her presentation. Is, is as shown on the screen, so I won't read it out. Um, please go ahead. Um. Okay. Uh, thanks for uh, the introduction of Professor Chin. Uh, and uh, I will play my pre recorded presentation. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Xia Tujun from Shanghai Library. It's a pleasure to share about using ontology to promote the demonstration of digital memory. There are four cases I want to share for you. According to the social memory theory, the variety of collections of glams are the mediums of cultural memory which can be used to support cultural and historical research, and also can be used to tell stories about the culture and the history of a person, a community, or a city. Now, most of them have been digitized and become parts of digital memory. The way to tell stories with digital memory resources in multimedia is brandly new. We can utilize data visualization technology, VR, AR, and MR technologies, and along with the interactive design methods for digital narrative. Ontology is a good method to promote the demonstration of digital memory. For example, there are abstracts in metadata records of genealogy documents. In the abstract, there is information about the family's ancestors who had migrated from one place to another. Ontology can provide an advanced perspective and structured thinking to look through the unstructured information in multimedia and provide a data modeling method of knowledge organization. It can also help enrich and reveal the relationships among terms, names, and entities. With the linked data technology, it can support authority control in a web scale. We extracted over 70,000 of migration events from more than 70,000 of genealogy metadata records. The place and person names in the Chinese traditional temporal terms are linked to the name authority knowledge bases and controlled vocabularies with HTTP URIs. With GIS technologies, we realized the migration events across more than 2,000 years on one map with a timeline. Every single line means an event or many events from one place to another. The corner and thickness of the line have their meanings. We can set different colors for places from where a person 
he had migrated to another. The different historical place names of one place are mapped into the controlled vocabulary with longitude and latitude data. It can make the visualization result more accurate. On the right corner of the screen, the statistic data displays how many people and places involved during the period on the timeline correspondingly. Here is the second case. We transform the information of family members from genealogy documents into semantic data according to the ontology. In the relationships among those family members are well revealed by the relationship ontology vocabulary. More importantly, some of the famous people of the family are linked to the name authority database and then have more relationships with other people beyond the genealogy documents from some other external database like CBDB, a very famous database maintained by Harvard University. Then, a data artist named Xiang Fan from Tsinghua University designed and implemented these family trees as immersive social networks. By this way, one family tree has been integrated into the whole forest. We can walk into the forest to feel and experience the reproduction of Chinese people. The third case is about the cultural and historical chronology of Shanghai, which consists of 10 thousands of events, involve more than 12 subject fields, such as art, publication, literature, education, music, movie, architecture, and so on. Usually, People visualize the chronology as a timeline, but in my opinion, the development of culture and history is not only linear. It can't be displayed like this. One event just happened after another. In fact, most possibly, Something happened because of another thing or many other things happened before. The relationships among events are more complicated and diversified and depend on the people, organizations, places, subject fields related to the events. The ontology can help us describe those abundant relationships. So, the macroscopic view of our visualization of the chronology is a life tree growing along with the time from the bottom to the top. The tree is composed of thousands of interrelated events. We can zoom in to see the details and click on the nodes to see the detailed information of a person, an organization, or an architecture. The final case is about virtual digital person, also called metahuman, which is very popular while the vision of metaverse arised this year. An application 
of MetaHuman is to create a digital avatar of a real historical person to tell the stories about himself and the era he lived in. There is the digital avatar of Su Xi, published by Zhonghua Book Company recently. Sushi is a very famous artist and literateur, lived in Song Dynasty, 1,000 years ago, and almost loved by every Chinese. But for now, this digital avatar only has the appearance, voice, and behavior which makes it just looks like a person. I think it needs to have intelligence more like a real person. It means that the avatar would have the ability to respond appropriately and automatically to external stimulation. Most importantly, it would be embedded with memory, which can identify where a person came from and who he was. The memory of a historic person includes all the personal information, life experiences, social networks, and all the cultural works he had created or others created about him. So I designed an ontology model to bestow digital memory to make human of a real historical person. There are five components. Personal memory includes the basic information such as names, birthday, born place, gender, and so on. And also the personal experiences and his particular ideology. Family memory includes family members and relatives with relationships, local culture like dialect of his hometown. Place memory is the different places a person lived or passed. Cultural memory is the cultural works created by or about a person. Communicative memory includes the people, communities, organizations which a person had ever communicated with. Let's take Sushi as an example. I developed an ontology vocabulary for the data fusion of all the digital memory resources related to him. And now we have a lot of RDF data about Sushi. his personal information as personal memory, migration experiences as place memory, family members and re relatives with relationships among them as family memory, social networks as communicative memory, and the works he created or others created about him as cultural memory. The place memory can be realized on the map, and the communicative memory can be realized as interactive knowledge graph. But how to put all this into the metahuman and make it more intelligent and communicative, like a real person, 
I'm still trying to work on it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chi Jian. This is so impressive. And uh, I think what our time is uh, um, is up. And well, uh, I, I think we all know each other's uh, uh, mm -hmm. contact information. Even if you don't uh, have it, you can always search the web or um, ask me uh, if you need to contact uh, uh, one of the presenters. Um, and thank you all for the wonderful uh, presentations. I learned a lot. Thank you. And I think this is the end of our session. And also the audience um, almost gone now. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.